Hello, Ender Sword here again, this time with a video on PvP crews and how those crews interact with each other. Uh, it's been a few months since I talked about this, uh, and there are basically four main crews in the meta now that are used on different ship types. And I wanted to get into when do you use one versus another? When does one ship type have an advantage over the other? And when should you be shifting from one crew uh, to another different type of crew for that same type of ship? Uh, there was an alliance on our server that did a for fun event uh, a couple days ago in their territory. They just had people come over and PVP for fun uh, during their takeover to kind of test out crews, test out ships, uh, just play around ahead of the incursion that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, and there were a few highlights from that that I wanted to show just to kind of prove and reinforce to people the idea that things like ship power are not the end all be all of who's going to win something. It very often is very much the stats that you have, the research you have, the crew you have, buildings that you have behind it that are going to reinforce certain things on whether you're winning or not. So I've got a few kind of funnier examples uh, of some of them here. In this case, a survey ship uh, taking out a properly crewed Talios. Um, obviously, in this case, I am out leveling the person by a fair bit. But the big difference here is things like having your Q building up to scratch. That's going to enhance your crit damage and lower their crit damage. Having your Bajoran research done is going to, again, enhance your crit damage and crit chance while simultaneously lowering theirs. Making sure that all your research is up to date. You don't necessarily need things like the primes that cost money, but just making sure that your isolitic research is up to date in territory and in the starship tree. Uh, making sure that all your crit research is up to date, things like that. And then, of course, officer levels. Now that there is more ability to unlock some of these strike team officers in the uh, wave defense store, definitely be focusing on that, the Section 31 store. Uh, because now, again, it's no longer something you necessarily have to pay for. Anyone can level those things up if you put the work into the waves uh, and try and get uh, credits from that and then focus on the crews that are important to you. So just wanted to flip through a couple of the, the funnier examples of these. Stella, actually a pretty good ship. Uh, same crew against same crew, able to take out something bigger. If we look at something with a more even uh, level matchup here, there's really no advantage in terms of levels on one versus the other, but just the ship type advantage and the crew advantage of a Pillum versus a pretty high level uh, Borg cube is going to end up favoring the Interceptor, and I'll get into why a little bit later. Um, a Brel taking out a pretty big Pillum, again, properly crewed Pillum, although using Damar instead of Garrick, may have won had this been switched to a Garrick instead of the Damar. I'll get to that later. But again, relatively even levels. Uh, another just kind of silly one, basically taking almost no damage uh, versus a Kelvin, uh, about five times its size, and then punching up against a Diderex, uh, Dideradex, uh, where, again, the crew... Not perfectly optimal, but not terrible using the right uh, shacks. But again, you're able to punch up quite a bit when you're using the right things, when you're in a good matchup, and when your stats, underlying buildings, research, things like that are uh, working out for you. So wanted to get into what the main crews actually are. So the first and most generic crew available is going to be the Freeman, Honor Guard, Wharf, and Lorca crew. So the way that this works is her officer ability is that if on, on the start of any round, if the enemy player has any state, then she increases your isolytic damage by, and then that depends on the tier of your Freeman. Starts at 60%, 70%, and mine's at 90%. Hopefully get that up later once the uh, Section 31 store uh, allows me to. I've got the faction for it. So she's going to increase the isolytic damage that you do. Um, and isolytic, as you know, bypasses mitigation, the normal mitigation of a ship, and instead uses their isolytic defense, and then hits the shields and hull uh, the same as normal damage after that. And it's her captain's ability that on the start of combat against players, uh, Carol increases the number of shots that you do by 100%. So straight up at the beginning of combat with no precondition, she is just going to double 
the amount of shots that you're actually firing. So that's what makes her so strong. And the fact that she works on any state on your opponent. So if your opponent has morale, if you're able to inflict hull breach, if you're able to inflict burning, then Carol Freeman is going to work for you. The one that we're generally going to be using to inflict that state is going to be Lorca. A lot of low level, low level players may not have Lorca unlocked yet. If you do not, you can substitute in somebody like Gorkon, uh, which you likely do have access to, to inflict Hull Breach instead. However, Gorkon does it based on shots already fired, so he may not trigger right away. Whereas Lorca's ability is at the beginning of each round, he has a chance to trigger Hull Breach on your opponent, which then lasts for two rounds. So at tier four, don't quite have him maxed out yet. He's at a 75% chance. I think he starts at a 50% uh, chance. Uh, I'd have to double check that, but starts somewhere about halfway, uh, tiers up to 75 at tier four, and then maxes out at 80% at tier five. So he never actually hits 100%. So there is always a problem with this crew that if your Lorca does not fire on round number one, then it does not activate the isolytic damage uh, that Carol Freeman does, which can be a huge problem. So you're basically doing half the damage or close to half the damage that you should be doing because it doesn't actually trigger that. And it also causes not having the hull breach then impacts how uh, Honor Guard Wharf works in that Lorca would usually increase the damage that your crits do by 1.5 times uh, on the end of whatever your normal crit damage is. So having him not trigger is a really big misfire uh, in the setup, and it's probably the biggest weakness with this crew, that even if your Lorca is maxed out, one out of five times, or in my case, one out of four times, on that first round, it's simply not going to fire at all, and then you've kind of got these weapons that are very, very nerfed compared to what they're supposed to be. The way the Honor Guard Wharf works on this is for the first eight rounds of combat, which is plenty. Most combat does not go beyond two or three rounds uh, at this point anymore. Uh, and again, at tier four, he is at a 75% increase to the crit chance. I believe at tier five, that increases to 100% chance. So you have the 75 is probably already mostly enough against most opponents. So you have an innate chance to crit, which is usually around 20%, uh, based a little on the ship and based a bit on some research and stuff uh, that you have as well. You add on to that the 75% additively. So it's very likely if you've got a tier four wharf and you are fighting against an opponent, as long as they don't have something that is reducing your crit chance, then you're likely at 100% or very close to 100% there anyway. The key to Wharf though, is it is a flat 75%, so it does not increase each round. So if your opponent does have something that reduces your crits, it's gonna cut into that, and then he does not continue to add to it. It is a flat amount uh, outright. So the key to how this works is the combat starts, your Carol trigger, triggers the 100% shot increase, your Lorca hopefully triggers most of the time and it places Hull Breach on your opponent. The fact that Hull Breach is now on your opponent triggers Carol's isolytic damage increase instantly and will enhance the amount of damage that you do from the crits that Honor Guard Wharf plus your natural critting ability does to the enemy ship. Uh, so that's basically how they work out. If Lorca does not fire, then suddenly that chain reaction has not happened and you are now fighting without most of your isolytic damage um, and it's gonna basically leave you doing close to half the damage that you should really be doing and then once you add the crits into that, even a little bit less. So if you're critting most of the time, those crits should be doing 50% more than they're doing, and they should have isolytic damage to them. If Lorca doesn't trigger, you don't get either of those things. He can then trigger next round, but in a lot of the PvP meta right now, a lot of things are one round fights. If you've got two big ships against each other with a lot of damage, they're able to kill each other in the first round. Uh, so missing that can be a very big detriment. So this is a very strong crew and it's a crew that a lot of people have access to given that Carol Freeman was 
pretty freely available. You could get her in a $20 battle pass, and there's been a lot of opportunity since then. A lot of people have her at at least tier one at this point, and Lorca and Honor Guard Wharf is kind of just a matter of time. You get Honor Guard Wharf uh, shards from the Amalgam Poles, and Lorca you can get from either the Discovery if you have uh, the refit on that, or you can just get him for the, through normal officer pulls. He also shows up in the four-star Armada packs, the rare ones. Uh, so again, most people are gonna probably, by your 40s, have him at at least the tier one, if not higher than that. Uh, is kind of a long run to get, but again, you probably didn't need to buy him to, to still have him available. Uh, so this is kind of your generic crew that technically works on any ship so as you saw from my example earlier you can even put this on a survey ship and there's nothing that actually restricts it to whether it's going to work or not it just triggers the abilities and because freeman is anything can work then it will uh, trigger anyway the one caveat to freeman is that morale on your own ship does not count it, if the enemy has morale, that actually does count. So if they've put morale on their ship, even if your hull breach does not trigger, then the morale on their ship actually counts. So if you're fighting against an explorer crew with the Wayun crew, which I'll mention in a second, then their morale will actually cause it to work, even if your Lorca did not fire. So that's an interesting caveat there. In terms of which ship this would theoretically work best on, it would work best when placed on an interceptor uh, because the hull breach works well with the interceptor itself, and it would trigger the artifacts that you have providing extra isolytic damage uh, to an interceptor when it has hull breach. So it has the best fit on an interceptor, but largely you should use it on the ship that you don't have the custom crew for, basically. So it's kind of the best generic one. You either just stick it on whatever your best ship is or the one that you don't have uh, the best custom crew for. So I tend to use this actually on my second best ship, which is a Corvus at the moment. And then I use my pure interceptor crew on the Sanctus. So the way that this crew works is a tiny bit different, but has a lot of the same principles to it, but they actually work differently over time. So the captain in this one is going to be Gul Dukat. <clears throat> His captain's ability is while on an interceptor fighting a player ship at the start of a round, Gul Dukat has a 100% chance, 100% because of the... Uh, because of the synergy here, naturally it'd be 20, but they're both adding 40% each. So he's at 100% chance to apply hull breach to it for three rounds. Uh, and then that would just renew after the three rounds as well as it can happen uh, every round. So basically, instead of Lorca that we saw before that only had that 50, I think it's 50, 60, 75, 80% chance of triggering, he's going to have a 100% chance. Gul Dukat will never misfire. He's always going to hit the enemy ship with the hull breach, so you can be completely guaranteed uh, that he's going to do it. Once he has hit that hull breach, his officer ability is while on an interceptor fighting a player ship with hull breach, which we just put on, then Gul Dukat is going to increase the number of shots that you have by 42% on tier 4. Again, I was able to use the section 31 store uh, to level him up now to tier 4. If he's at tier 3, I think it's 35%, 27% before that. Um, so if you've got him, the higher level he is, the more of the increased shots that you're going to get on, uh, on your weapons. The interesting thing here is it's going to be once per weapon for five rounds. So this gets cumulatively better and better and better the longer the fight goes on. So while it actually starts off a little worse, or not even a little worse, about half as effective as the uh, Freeman, who's gonna give you 100% extra shots, each time you fire a weapon, that 42% becomes cumulative. So on the Sanctus here that has three weapons fire in that first round, by the end of the first round, now I'm at over 100%. Uh, for the following rounds, like by quite a bit. So it, even if you're at, say, a tier three, it's 35%. At the end of that, you're going to be at 105%. So going into round two, 
Gal Ducat is now actually outperforming Freeman for every subsequent round, but has not outperformed on the very first shots. So it takes a couple shots to catch up to how good Freeman is. But then from that point on, the longer the fight is, the better he's going to be as this becomes cumulative uh, for the duration of the fight. Andy Billups is going to be the isolytic wingman here. His officer ability is if you're on an interceptor and the enemy player has hull breach, which again, we've put on with Gul Dukat, he's going to increase the isolytic damage by 75% in this case. I've got him at tier two, one lower than my, uh, my Freeman is, uh, but that's again, gonna depend on your tier. It's 60% at tier one, 75%. Uh, 90% then I think it eventually caps out I think at I think 140 uh, is the tier 5 uh, it'll be a while before I get there um, but yeah tier 2 still doing pretty well and then the wingman on this side is going to be Garrick so the way Garrick works is that if you're again fighting a player ship with hull breach which we put on at a maxed out Garrick which again I was able to do through the uh, section 31 store has a 60% increase to critical chance by 60% each round. So whereas the first crew that we saw, uh, the Honor Guard Wharf increased it by 75% right away for eight rounds, it did not add 75% each round. Whereas Garrick gives 60% right away and then add 60% each round. At first that seems like, well, that's silly, because you can't have a 180% chance, you can't go above 100. But the trick to this is that some other crews and some other abilities, other researches can lower your crit chance. So it's possible that you start the fight that even when you've got, let's say 20% on your ship, plus 60% on Garrick is 80%, your opponent has something that's lowering that by say 30% to 50 the second round, Garrick is going to add another 60% and bring you back above 100 so that you're going to have that guaranteed chance again to hit. So while in the first round you may not be guaranteed, Garrick is going to continue to add that 60% to it until eventually you're going to reach that 100%, even if that takes two rounds, three rounds, four rounds, uh, whatever it is. So the higher your Garrick is, the more it's adding to that chance. So in round one again, it's initially a little bit weaker than we would see with the Freeman crew, but it's going to add up to something stronger later on. So that's largely why I end up using this on my best ship, because for two reasons. One, it's going to survive. It's going to do better the longer the fight is. So if you do completely round one fights, the Freeman crew is probably better. If you're getting into two, three rarely four round fights, but two or three round fights, this crew actually starts to overpower the abilities of the Freeman crew in round two and three. And then the last thing that's the real clincher for me is because the Gold Ducat is 100%, whereas one in four times my Lorca is not going to fire. And if your Lorca does not fire and you're against a reasonably evenly matched opponent, you're going to die to that opponent in a pretty brutal way. Whereas in this case, if I'm fighting an evenly matched opponent, I'm not counting on RNG to win the fight. I know that I've got a guaranteed uh, success path uh, to that. I'll swing back uh, at the end to talk about some of the lower deck stuff because, of course, you can move those around under some of the different crews. The third crew is going to be the battleship one. And actually, sorry, let me just flip back here because there's something else to discuss because... Uh, one of the screenshots I showed earlier showed this as the crew variant. And this used to be the more dominant thing, and this may actually become the more dominant thing in the future if fights start to get longer again. So the way that Demar works uh, is that he actually kind of does the somewhat opposite thing uh, as Garrick, but instead of lowering your crit chance, it's going to decrease their crit damage that they do. If Demar scores a critical hit, which you're going to get most of the time if he's with Garrick, then he decreases your opponent's critical damage by 42% once per weapon for three rounds. So again, if you critical hit in each of the three weapons that you have for a round, he's going to lower their damage by 
126 percent uh at tier four here uh and i think that goes to 50 percent when he's maxed out so you could take him down 150 percent per round that everything is firing and critting over time that's going to take their crit damage and in the old days it would reduce it to zero so when you were using uh ducat before the isolatic era you used ducat garrick and damar together if you had a good Demar, it would eventually reduce your opponent's critical hit damage to literally zero. Now there is research that gives you the crit floor, so it can't actually be reduced to zero. Uh, it can only be reduced to 100% if you've only got the ex-Borg favors, and 200% if somebody has bought the Prime uh, to be able to do that. And by the way, I've not bought that Prime. I don't think you should. Um, it's not necessary for the Zindi, and I think it's a waste of money, at least in the current meta. There may be a future where it becomes useful, but right now, I, I don't think it's useful. Um, so yeah, that's why you used to, Damar used to be the absolute master of PvP. Now, unfortunately, he's not. Uh, he's kind of been usurped by the fact that the fights don't last long enough for him to really work, because he used to be able to like start zeroing people out in like the third round of combat, fights just don't get to that point anymore, and you'd m be much better off uh, doing the isolated damage and doing extra crits than you are trying to play this long game and, uh, and work him out. Trip Tucker has a similar ability that he's gonna reduce the critical hit damage your opponent does by 80%, and if you get him all the way to tier five, I think it's 250%. So he has some potential in the future to become valuable. However, he's not right now, and the fact that it works for two rounds instead of uh, longer like Demar does where it just accumulates, um, it's, it's hard to say that that's going to be useful, and particularly now that there is the damage floor, basing a game around that doesn't make as much sense as it used to. So anyway, uh, detour back to interceptors, but back to the battleship. This crew is a tiny bit more debatable in terms of who goes with who. So the battleship strike team... I think used to be effectively the best of the three strike teams simply because of how strike team Yuna worked. She would just rip the shields off your opponent or ignore them basically uh, so that after you got to the third round, you were completely ignoring your opponent's shields and everything was going direct to your hull. Because fights have gotten so much shorter, that is less effective than it used to be. So I'll talk about the two options basically for this crew, and it is debatable which type of fight you're in, which one you want to be using. So in this case, she's a little different than Gul Dukat in that her captain's ability is going to be when you're on a battleship fighting a burning player ship, then at the start of each round, she's going to increase the number of shots by 100%. So Gul Dukat's, that was his officer ability, was to increase the number of shots. And I believe with Wei Yun, it's the same thing. His officer ability is what's increasing the number of shots. In this case, it's her captain ability. So that's the thing that you're picking up the synergy on. Now, what's interesting here is the way that they made the synergies work. So Shax is a synergy to Lon, and Ortegas is a synergy to Lon, as is Strike Team Una. But the way that they made it work, if you only have one of this type of officer, then he's giving you the 65% synergy. Once you put the second one on, She's giving you 65%, but he is only reduced to 25%, meaning the extra shots are now 100%, which is equivalent to what they are with Freeman. If, however, you switch to Yuna, which is a different type of officer, hers is 65 and his is 65, and when we lock that in and come back, we now see that our lawn is at 140% extra shots. So the two options here are to go with the Ortegas, and the way that Ortegas works is going to be to delay, potentially delay shots from your opponent. So while on a battleship fighting a player ship, and notice that this one does not say, and the player ship is burning. So in this case, you're simply on a battleship and you're fighting a player, period. It does not have to be burning for this to work. Strike Team Ortegas causes weapon shot by them to have a 52% chance at Tier 3. 
uh, of having their next attack delayed by one round. So now that fights are really, really short, having an ability that can basically coin flip whether a weapon even fires or not and can push that into the next round can be a gigantic savings in terms of damage on your ship. So if somebody is using something like a Talios, which only fires one weapon in the first round, and you get this coin flip to delay it, then that then they literally don't fire uh, for that round entirely. They have to wait to round two. In the meantime, you're firing your shots against them. Uh, the trade-off to this, of course, is that it's not 100% chance. It really is kind of a tier three here, a coin flip on whether you're going to delay it or not. And of course, ships have multiple weapons. So if you're fighting against, say, a Sanctus, you may delay one of their weapons. You may delay two of their weapons. Uh, it's most likely going to be one of those two. That can save you a lot of damage, but she's not actually outputting any more damage or more offense. It's more defensive that you're stopping them to, from firing, but it doesn't actually help you directly do more damage to them on Shaxx's side it does so here he's got the if you're on a battleship while it is burning he's going to increase your isolated cascade this is very similar to we saw on Andy Billups uh, as long as they're burning he's going to trigger this uh, and do extra isolytic damage to them that certainly is worth a lot however the alternative here is to use the strike team Una. Her captain's or her officer ability is while on a battleship fighting a player. Again, this does not require that it is actually burning at the time. Uh, she is going to decrease the shield mitigation that they have by 30% for each round. And that's uh, again at uh, tier uh, three here uh, that it's going to be 30%. This is a little bit misleading. Uh, the mitigation of someone's shield starts at. 80%. So you would think when you say reduce mitigation by 30%, it would mean 30% of the total 100% that shields mitigate. That's never how Scopely math works for whatever reason. It literally means subtracting the number 30 from the number it usually does, which is 80. So if they've got normal 80% shield mitigation, and there's a couple cases where it's higher than that if you're Titan buffed, Cerritos buffed, I think just Titan buffed, uh, and there's a couple researches in the 50s that increase that mitigation by a little bit. Uh, but basically it takes whatever that number is, usually 80%, it's gonna subtract 30 in one round, subtract 30 in the next round, subtract 30 in the third round, and by the third round they will have, no matter how much of their shield is left, the shield is not mitigating anything anymore. So it will all your shots will ignore the shield and go directly to the hull of the player. Uh, so that's the benefit there. And this is why this used to be one of, used to be basically the best crew, uh, because she would eventually just ignore the shields. And regardless of what you're fighting, everything would go direct to that hull while the other player is still hitting against your shield a bit. The drawback to this now is that the fights are often so quick and vicious that in round one, your shield's gone anyway. Um, so even if she doesn't reduce this mitigation, it's likely that all your weapons firing in round one are enough to at least completely deplete the shield of the opponent, if not kill them outright. So the real benefit to her is while the shield thing is a little good, is that your synergy is actually better between the two. So you're now gonna get that additional 40% added on to the 100% here to fire more shots against your opponent. So it's really a trade-off of, do I want to use Strike Team Una, who's gonna do more damage output, or do I want to do Ortegas, who is going to have a chance of reducing my enemy's output against me? And there's a little bit of a trade-off in terms of which one is better. I would generally say that the longer the fight seems to be, uh, the more it's going to favor Una because her shield thing is going to start to matter more and the shots are going to start to uh, outpace what you would have avoided on the Ortega side. Whereas if you're going to be in a brutal one, maybe two round fight, then you're probably better off with the Ortegas, where it has a chance of completely shutting down your opponent's weapons. And even though you're not firing quite as much, you're surviving a little bit longer. And in the end, you're going to fire more weapons than they do because you're shutting some of theirs down while they are uh, 
unable to do anything about yours. So that's kind of the way they work. Out of all the PvP meta crews right now, though, this one I think is the weakest by far. And the reason for it is it doesn't have anything that's going to help you crit anymore. And that's such a huge part of the fighting. The Freeman crew has Honor Guard Wharf that increases the crits. And the Interceptor team has Garrick that increases the crits. In this case, you're really just down to the natural crit ability that you have, which is likely somewhere in that 20 to 30% range. And depending on what your opponent has in terms of their crew, in terms of their research, they may actually be reducing that crit range even further uh, to the teens or even down to zero so that you're not going to crit in the fight at all while your opponent is actually able to. So I think the way that these stack up isn't really balanced uh, in that way. The other thing is that the burning ability reduces the hull of your opponent by 1% per round, but that's not very effective uh, in a PvP fight that's so short. So you delete one, 2% of their hull in a one or two round fight, that's not super effective. You're going to want something more impactful than that. The hull breach that we get from the Freeman crew and the Interceptor crew is going to be so much stronger because it's just increasing your damage output by a flat 50% on top of every crit that you do. In this case, it's a very slow whittling down of their hull and a fight's never going to last long enough uh, for that to matter, especially not in the current meta. So Generally, what I've been going with this is this one, uh, where we are going to focus on delaying their weapons and try and get into a longer fight. I want to shut as much of their stuff off as possible. I think this will get a lot better as I tier the Ortegas up. So if you get this to a tier four, tier five, and it starts to get a more than likely, more likely than not chance of delaying their weapons, I think that gets a little better. But again, this lacks the power punch that you get from both the Interceptor crew and the Freeman Honor Guard Wharf crew. Uh, it's more of a drawn out fight. It, it's more of a, you need to reduce their damage because it's gonna take you longer to get your damage onto them. Uh, so that's where that one uh, kind of falls apart, and it's why I lean against battleships as a really good PvP force right now. They're kind of the least good uh, of the three. Getting to the last main crew is going to be the Weyoun crew with Jack Ransom. So in this case, we've got Weyoun with a captain's ability uh, that is on round start. Weyoun has a 100% chance to apply morale for three rounds. And sorry, I, again, I'm gonna skip back just to make the brief comment because I didn't cover her officer ability. Her actual officer ability that puts the burning on is not 100%, uh, in, at least not at, uh, at tier two. I think it gets to 100%, but most people are probably not gonna have a tier five epic uh, officer for this. So she is not always going to put the burning on. That's fine for the officer ability of the strike team companion, but that's not fine for Shax. If the burning does not get on in the round, and in this case, there's a one in three chance that it will not in the first round, then you do not get the isolytic damage. So this one is very subject to the level of your uh, epic captain. The others are not as subject to how powerful they are. A tier one or tier two epic guy is going to be fine in terms of getting the effect on, uh, and then their other ability will suffer. In this case, it's the chance of getting the effect on that is suffering and not the number of shots. So just wanted to touch on that before I get too far into this one. Uh, so yeah, Wei Yun has a 100% chance to apply morale for three rounds, so very similar to the way uh, that Gal Dukat works. This is a 100% chance to get on. It's not going to fail, and it's not based on the tier that you're at. The captain's ability of Wei Yun is based on your tier, and this is increases weapon shots by 88% at the start of each round for two rounds. So in this case, again, starts off a little bit worse than Freeman is, who gives you that flat 100%. By, by the time you get to the second round, now he's going to be doing 176% extra shots uh, to it. 
So does get better once you get to round two, but for that first round is not quite as good as uh, Carol Freeman is going to be. And since a lot of fights end in one round, then that's going to be a factor in this. His wingman is going to be Jack Ransom. This one, similar to the others, if you're on an explorer with morale, so instead of hull breach on the other ship or burning on the other ship, it's now going to be your own ship. So if your explorer has morale, then Jack Ransom increases your isolated cascade by 75% for one round against players. So that will trigger if you have morale on your own ship. Uh, then the wingman here is going to be Pawn. And the reason we pick Pawn is because of his officer's ability. Pawn decreases the opponent player's chance by 70% at the start of each round, four, three rounds on an explorer with morale. So in this case, it's going to take the chance that they have critting, reduce it by 70%, and then reduce it by a further 70% the next round and a further 70% the round after that. So it can reduce their chance to basically below zero. So you effectively cannot crit at all. So if you're using this crew, against let's say the freeman crew because honor guard wharf gives you a 75 percent chance you've got an innate let's say 20 25 percent chance from just your ship and research and stuff then he's going to reduce that by 70 assuming that you don't have other suppressive research which does exist so he's going to reduce that by 70 percent and then you've got a 30 percent chance let's say then the next round, he's going to reduce it by a further 70% chance, and you haven't gained anything. So now you're at a negative 40% chance, and you cannot crit for the rest of the fight. The trade-off here is, of course, this crew itself doesn't have anything that gives you extra crits. So it doesn't have anything that's going to cause you to crit any more than whatever your innate chance already is. So if you're an explorer already has, again, 20 25% chance, that's all you're going to crit if the opponent has research or some ability that reduces that, it's going to be reduced to zero as well. So this is a really good crew actually for when you don't want to be punched up against, when you don't want big, big guns coming into play. If you're the person that already probably has the advantage, then doing this crew kind of shuts down the other crew's abilities to come at you. So it's kind of if you're if you're the big guy in a fight and you can either just fight someone with your bare fists or both of you are allowed to use guns well then why would you fight someone that's like five foot three but they're allowed to use a gun when you could just punch them so you're kind of disarm you're mutually disarming each other basically saying i'm not going to have crits but you're not going to have crits either we're now just going to basically fight on our isolytic damage, our ship strength, and the shots that we fire. And there's not a degree of randomness to it anymore based on those crits. There's not a big spike of damage. We're gonna have a slightly longer fight, but if I'm in something that's just a very tanky, nice explorer, then I'm probably going to overpower you, provided my ship power was bigger to begin with, or whether I had some advantage to begin with. It just neutralizes the advantages they may have from other things in the fight, and you're just evening the playing field. So largely, if you are the superior ship, and you see that someone else is using the Freeman crew, or someone else is using uh, that interceptor crew, then doing this can just kind of suppress that a bit, and you're going to just come out ahead. Uh, so it's almost the even the playing field uh, sort of crew uh, that you want to be using here. And Garrick, of course, is going to try and fight against this. So as much as Pawn is reducing uh, by that 70% per round for three rounds, you've got Garrick that is trying to increase it by 60% each round with no cap. So if you ever get into a situation where the fights are starting to get longer than three, four, or five rounds, then the Garrick will eventually start to overpower Pawn. That used to be the case in some of the old meta where you would actually have eight to 10 round PVP fights. 
now with so much additional isolytic damage, that's not as big a factor. But if over time the PvP meta does shift to something longer again, then again, Garrick is going to come into prominence in that if he's really high level, uh, then he can eventually outpace uh, what Pawn is doing in terms of suppression, because Pawn's suppression is only for three rounds, whereas his is going to be 60% added indefinitely uh, for however long the fight is. So you'll lose your crits, but then you'll start to get them back uh, towards the end of a long fight. So talking now about some of the below deck officers, there are a couple of generic ones that just kind of work, whether it's PvP or PvE, but aren't necessarily the best. So Tendi, for instance, adds a percentage to the ship hull, 170% here at tier four. However, in terms of real percentage, that 170% is probably like two or 3% to me in reality. So if you've got the spot, you might as well use it. But if you don't, there's better officers that you want to be using anyway. So if I'm trying to crew up like four or five ships for uh, like a territory takeover, I'm probably going to have an officer like this in the below decks. But if I'm really trying to focus on one ship, and this is the thing I'm fighting with right now, as I often do in incursions, I'm going to load everyone up on one ship and really, really stack that one. Uh, Tom Paris doesn't work. I just kind of have him there. Um, the below deck ability of someone like an Odo, increasing your critical hit damage by 35% is definitely a big one when it comes to PvP. PvP is very often won by who has the highest crit damage percentage, particularly when you're fighting with those interceptor crews or that Freeman crew. This isn't going to matter as much on a battleship or on the explorer with the Weyun crew. Um, Generally, if you're on a battleship, you might as well assume that your crit damage is going to be, or your crit percentage, your chance, is going to be reduced to basically zero anyway. You're not going to be critting that much. Whereas for the interceptor crews and the Freeman crew, you want to have your crit damage as high as possible because that's really what's driving your killing power here. So him increasing at tier three, the crit damage by 35% is actually quite a bit uh, when it comes to PvP. The uh, other officer here is going to increase your isolytic damage. So Dr. Tana at uh, tier two is going to be at 80%. I think it was uh, 60% for tier one. And that scales up. The To touch on isolytic damage, the way that it works, because a lot of people don't quite know, it works the same as an efficiency. So your normal, ice, if you have no isolytic damage at all, then your isolytic damage is basically 100 100%. So it takes the isolytic damage you do, divides it by 100% or divides it by one, meaning that it hasn't changed. So if someone does a million isolytic damage to you and you have no isolytic defense, then that million damage hits your shields, it's mitigated 80%, and then 20% of it hits your hull. If you have some isolytic defense, then it's going to take that number and additively add it to 100%, and then divide by that amount. So if I had a 100% base and then 100% isolated damage, I'm going to take that million, divide it by 200% or divide it by two, and then that million is now going to have 500,000 of it mitigated. So it will stay in your combat log. The isolated damage mitigation was this amount. It will be 50%. Then that remaining 50% will hit your shield in your hull. As you go above that, same principle applies. So if I've got a 200% isolytic damage, then in reality, it's 100% plus 200%, divide that number by three, divide that number by four, whatever your number is, just add an additional one in front of it and uh, or add it to the first number, and that's what you're going to get. So at this point, uh, I think all together between this and artifacts and your ship's defense and research and stuff, a lot of people are now in that two to 300% range uh, at reasonably high levels if they've got some of these officers. So uh, you won't see it on your ship because again, it's something that activates in combat uh, most of the time, but your isolytic defense say that it's around, I think is around 355% that your effectively mitigating about 70% uh, 
of the damage that's incoming from the other ship, and it starts to be in line with your normal mitigation, which caps out at 71%. As far as I know, isolytic defense does not cap out, so you can continue to uh, gain onto this, but there is a diminishing return. So like I said, the first 100%, is going to mitigate 50%. The second 100% is only going to bring you down to, uh, you know, two thirds of it. So it will be a bit of a diminishing return over that. But definitely in those first uh, levels that can help out. And if you're allowing the isolytic to hit you just without any mitigation at all, it's absolutely brutal. The more you can mitigate that out, it starts to bring it more in line uh, with how combat basically used to be, that there's mitigation, then shields, then hull. If it's completely skipping that first mitigation phase, then you're probably dead. Uh, you've got other officers below deck, like seven, that actually increase the amount of isolytic damage that you're doing as well. So in this case, uh, with no preconditions, seven of nine fighting against the player ship increases by a set percentage. It's not as big as the officers like ransom themselves, but given that you get it regardless and you can put her on any type of ship, uh, it's definitely good. This again is straight up additive. So if you've got a 70% and you've got 26%, that's 96%. So it doesn't compound, but it's straight up additive to the extra damage uh, that you're going to do. So she's super important. I'm generally going to have her on whatever my strongest ship is because that is a quite a powerful thing uh, to have added in. Kira's below deck ability, this gets down to reducing the crit chance of your opponent. At tier three, and sourcing for Kira has been pretty bad. So if you didn't get her originally, she really hasn't come up that much. But if you do ever see her come up, she is a super, super important PvP officer. She is going to reduce your opponent's critical hit chance by 20%. So basically, if I am ever fighting a battleship, then I know that the battleship is doing zero they are basically never ever going to crit because of having just Kira below deck. So they likely have something like a 20% innate chance. Some of your research is gonna reduce that a little bit more. If you've got any officer that reduces it, it's definitely gonna be zeroed. But even on an interceptor here where I'm not reducing it any further than that 20%, they're basically never gonna crit. You might see one once in a blue moon, but they're not gonna crit. Uh, so you can kind of rule that out. In the meantime, I'm critting like crazy. So that's really driving most of the fight. Desoc here is an interesting one. Uh, Desoc's ability reduces the officer's ability of the other person. But the way he works is if your opponent's whole health is below 95%, then he has a chance to assimilate their ship. So if you're fighting fresh ship versus fresh ship, he cannot trigger until round two because you haven't done any damage to them until the second round. Then on round two, once their hull's a little bit damaged, he can trigger. However, if you're in a larger fight, if you're in like territory fight, maybe an incursion fight where someone's been hit before, then having him below deck can trigger round one because you're starting a fight against somebody that does have their hull already damaged. So he can help out in those cases. If he does work, then he's going to apply this assimilate effect. That's going to reduce the officer's abilities, their effectiveness by 25%. That's going to take whatever their innate abilities are and reduce it a little bit. Some of those are a little fuzzy because usually when Scopely says something like by 25%, they don't mean by 25%, they mean subtract 25%, but because of the way he works, that's not entirely clear. It doesn't seem that it's a subtraction, it literally is a reduction uh, of their ability by 25%. So again, if this ap applied to somebody that's giving crit damage, giving isolytic damage, giving uh, crit chance, any other thing like that, it's going to reduce their ability. Uh, one of the more important ones being the shots fired uh, by them as well, that it's going to uh, reduce that. So again, he's a speculative one. If you've got room below decks, then you may put him on there. I don't always have him on as he's not necessarily top tier, but he could work. And the longer the fight is, again, the better he would actually be at it because there's more of a chance. And particularly, again, if you're fighting in a situation where you're going to be fighting opponents that are possibly already damaged, so like a territory fight, uh, 
then he could become more valuable. But if you're fighting clean, he can never trigger till round two. So he's, uh, he's definitely less valuable. Mariner is another kind of good, uh, just useful in all cases, not the best, but it's never a bad thing to have more weapon damage. But again, at a maxed out, this is 180%. Effectively, this is really only 4 or 5% for me, not 180%, simply because there's so many other things that give you extra weapon damage through your research, through the ship itself, like whatever, um, add on extra weapon damage. So in reality, it's 180% but it's compared to like 7,000% that you actually have total up. So it's not actually that much, but still any increase uh, to your raw damage is definitely going to be a good thing. The other person who is usually on this crew, but I moved them to use on the other, is going to be Ransom. Again, this works similar to uh, Dr. Tana, where you're on an interceptor. If the enemy player is hull breach, Jack Ransom is gonna increase your isolated defense by 50% for that one round. And again, that's based on his tier. And all of these guys has a, have a similar thing for the ship that they're not directly on. So Billups is an officer on an interceptor, but below deck, he goes on a battleship. Ransom is an officer on an explorer, but below deck, he goes on an interceptor. And then Shax works the same way as well. So again, these can help out with the isolytic damage. So if you really want to stack this, then of course you can take uh, Tana and put her on as well. And if you're really concentrating everything on one ship, then this is very often the setup that I have below where we've got two isolated defense officers, one crit reduction officer, one that increases the amount of isolated damage I do, and then one officer that is just generically increasing all damage uh, that I do in this. So if you do have these available, uh, then definitely this is probably the best overall setup to go with. Obviously in this case on an interceptor, since I'm using ransom, rotate in whichever one you need. Tana works on any of the ships, uh, so can always be put there for the extra isolytic uh, defense. And I think that may be all for the valuable uh, below decks folks. There are a couple that aren't as great. Uh, Rutherford can be added on in order to increase your shields. You're very unlikely to do that as your choice. Uh, if you don't have some of the others, you can plug them in, that's fine. Uh, but your shield is usually gonna be the thing you're worried the least about. Uh, Tendi doing it for the hull is probably better. There's these officers like Badgie uh, that increase your penetration and accuracy and stuff. It's such a small number and it's based off your base value that this is likely less than less than a tenth of a percent in terms of your actual combat effectiveness. So it's better than literally nothing, but it's barely better than literally nothing. You, you're probably not gonna notice it. Boimler's the same way, but on the defensive end, 108% uh, at tier four. Again, it's better than nothing, but it's barely better than nothing. The other two uh, folks that are out there are Gosa and the Borg Queen. This one, it is cumulative at least. So when Desoc triggers is going to trigger um, these abilities, so increases your own defense by 170%, 175% at tier three, that one's cumulative. So if you were in a really long fight, this would be useful. Again, it's not useful uh, in reality. It's gonna be in a single round, it's like less than a percent that you're gonna notice that you're actually mitigating more of. You'd have to have a really long fight for that to ever actually matter for you. And the Borg Queen is pretty much the exact same thing, just in the other direction. Her number is a bit bigger, but I've tested this out as well. And even in fights that are lasting four, five, six rounds, 400% for each round is still not a lot. It's uh, And it's because it's of the base. So there's a lot of officers that have the ability where it's like, this improves your percent by 400% of your defense. So it's taking a raw number and then scaling up that raw number into a pretty big number that can get into the millions. In her case, it's taking the base. And in Ghost's case, it's taking the base. Same with Boimler, same with Badgie. 
the fact that it's basing it off the base number is usually so much smaller than what your real numbers are once you've added on research and everything like that, uh, that it just isn't effective. And because it's like three office, if you took these three officers and compress them to one, they still might not be very good. But the fact that it's three officers taking three spots, absolutely terrible. So Desoc by himself, maybe you can put on if you've got the extra spot. But I think the way that I've got, uh, had the interceptor there set up where you've got them and uh, and Ransom at the front, I think is probably, uh, probably the way that you're gonna go. I would tend to trade her out and then put in Odo. Odo. And that's probably what you're going to run in terms of maximizing the damage you're doing, maximizing, limiting them. I'd probably actually swap out that extra few percent and Tana as well. So you've got defense, defense, damage, reduce their crit chance, damage. And that's probably the best way to go. If you've got five slots, if you've got a six slot, probably put Mariner in. It probably wouldn't be till I had like eight or nine slots that you'd start putting in uh, Desoc or Badgie or Boimler, but if you're running multiple ships, then you're probably going to uh, find spots for them. But it would very rarely be on your main ship uh, that you're going to be using. So I mentioned throughout this a few times things like buildings, and I think the one thing that is being slept on the absolute most is the Court of Q building. So I think a lot of people start it with this and they're like, oh, the forbidden tech and the forbidden tech says that I'm going to do 900% damage against players. So I'm as a PVP player, I'm going to do that. No, that's a red herring. That's garbage. Again, that 900% is like 6% in reality, something like that. So a lot of people took their proto matter and everything and put it towards the actual forbidden techs garbage absolute garbage things like you will never notice really that and if you want to kind of see the difference too in the incursion go to uh where you have an exo and it will give you that exo that gives you like plus 700 percent damage against players and then fight players again see if you even notice the 700 percent you're probably not going to so when you've got something at you know a level 20 pvp based uh i think this one is this is the pvp one at tier two uh yeah 600 percent damage against players sounds good it's not good it's not that good so you're barely going to notice it what you are going to notice is the building here so critical hit damage against players bonus at level 52 which is fairly high but I've, again this is free i haven't paid any money i'm just using the proto matter to convert to the building parts every day, which you get 300 a day, plus you can collect more from the dailies of doing the trials every single day and just pour it into this building is going to make a giant difference, a ridiculous difference. So adding 189% to the critical hit that you do against players adds it against hostiles too, so not just useful in PvP, and then it's going to reduce the damage that they do by 136% at the level 52. There's some big breaks in this. At level 20, it gets a lot better, and at level 40, there's a jump up, and it gets a lot better. So even if you're a lot lower than this, you're starting later, start to put into it now, and it's going to pay off uh, in the relatively near future. And just think of the differential. If, if they're not really focusing on their building, and I'm gaining 189%, but I'm taking away 136% from them, but they're at level whatever 15 of this where it's 15 percent and 10 percent then i'm gaining an advantage of more than 300 percent against them which is a ridiculous amount um when you're comparing one against the other my crits are just going to be hitting like absolute nuclear bombs and theirs are going to be doing nothing so there are definitely high level players out there that have not focused on this building that have not done those daily polls and instead have probably focused on the forbidden tech itself completely wrong the direction was the building and every the tech itself is an absolute red herring and an absolute waste of money resources everything that is garbage stuff this building is amazing so uh definitely pick that out the other thing that i know that a lot of people neglect and i've mentioned this in other videos before is the bajoran favors 
So by now, a lot of people have actually caught up to this. First, I was seeing people ignore this a lot. Uh, but again, you've got things in here that are decrease your opponent's critical hit damage against players by 100%. Increase your own by 70%. If you don't have this maxed, then again, that's a 170% gap that you have that another player may not have. And a lot of people kind of are still around this level three or four level uh, and don't have that maxed out yet. And it makes quite a big difference. Uh, there is as well, uh, yeah, the critical hit chance one. So here increases your critical hit chance by 5%. So I kept saying before, you know, 20 or 25%, largely dependent on whether you have this one research or not. So it seems relatively small, only 1% per level. But then when you look at some of the officers that exist, like Kira below decks, if she reduces at 20% and you are only at 20%, you're at zero. If, she, if you now have these bonuses, then you still have a chance to crit on a battleship even though they're reducing it. And same here, decreasing your opponent's critical hit chance against players. Again, you can enhance yours by 5%, but you can take 10% away from them. So basically, you're going to zero out anyone uh, that you're playing against if they don't have some of these extra uh, researches out there. And there's a prime as well that I think adds 10% to your critical hit chance. So having this maxed out can completely delete that. So it just reduces them right back to where they were and you can again get them at a, uh, at a 0%. So these are essential things to have and they're not something that costs money. They're something that's available to everyone. The Bajoran store is a great thing in general. It really, really helps your progression, particularly through the level 40s. So you really wanna be focusing on this. But I think what a lot of people, either they don't do them or they get distracted by uh, some of the other things you can do, which you want to be spending these metals on the various researches, which is ultimately your end goal. But then they hit a point that they've actually bought all the research they can and their reputation is not yet maxed out. You want to be doing the full reputation polls every single day that you possibly can because it unlocks that higher level of pvp research that is crucial and there is a point and i remember getting to this point even doing the max polls every day i got to a point where i'd done all the favor research i could and i still had to wait three months of max pulling before i got to the final level to then be able to do the rest of it so if you put that off then you're going to end up with this gap at the end where it's going to take you five to six months to get to the place you want to be so even though it seems self-defeating in some at the time to spend uh, these tokens on the reputation, particularly since the cost increases, you do want to be doing that as much as possible because in the long run, it's going to pay off for you. So um, that is a super, super crucial uh, PVP thing. So overall here, uh, overall here, I talk longer than I really intended to. I always intend to make like a 15, 20 minute video and then I don't. Um, but I hope that helps and it goes a little bit more in depth in terms of not just what, what are the crews and what do I do, but really how does it work and when do I switch my crew? And I think that's the most important question is for every one of these ships, there's a crew that is innate to that ship type, but there's also the Freeman crew. So when do I switch between the Freeman crew and the type of crew that I want to be using for this specific fight when do i want to focus on the high crit crew versus the basically your default is the freeman so if there was no knowledge about it you would probably just use the freeman crew where is that weaker it's weaker in the fact that Lorca is not a hundred percent the other ones are except for talon um so for stability you want to be using ducat or somebody else, uh, Ducat or Wei Yun. Uh, for a little more randomness, you're gonna be using Lorca. If you're facing someone that is an anti-crit crew flat, then using uh, Honor Guard Wharf is probably not gonna work. Garrick could start to work again, as he can overpower eventually that anti-crit. If you're facing um, 
you know, a battleship, what do you want to be using? If you're facing an explorer, what do you want to be using? Like, know your matchup, know how long the fight is going to take, and that may uh, at least have an idea. You're not going to know now, but to have an idea that if you're fighting a board cube, they're pretty tanky, they're not going to put out a lot of crits, so that fight could go a lot longer. So if you're doing lower damage and they're doing lower damage, you could be getting into three, four, five round fights. Um, whereas if you're two interceptors fighting each other, it's a round one fight. That's basically the way it's going to be. You're both glass cannons that are just firing out of your mind. Um, so which one do you want to be going against uh, there? So if I was fighting interceptor versus interceptor and I knew the other interceptor was doing the uh, Freeman crew, then I'm probably going to mirror with the Freeman crew. If they're doing the Ducat crew, then I'm going to probably Freeman or anti-crit them, uh, depending what it is. So um, there's also ships that you need to know what their firing pattern is. I mentioned early on the Talios as an example. It's a decent PvP ship. However, it only fires one weapon in the very first round. So a lot of the crewing for, say, the Ducat uh, crew requires a weapon to be fired in order for him to increase the number of shots that he's going to be doing. So he's only going to trigger once in the first round, where if it's on a Sanctus or a Pilum or some other interceptor, like a faction interceptor, they're going to fire more than one shot in that first round, whereas the Talios ramps up. So it's quite likely that your Talios just gets killed in the first round before you even have a opportunity for most of your weapons to come online. So you need to know that stuff as well. So largely, if you are fighting someone and losing, take a look at what the log looks like. Have you lost to a lot of crits? Is there an ability that you have to switch to an anti-crit crew to suppress that for them? So using an explorer, for instance, with the Weiyun crew, um, or is there a chance that you can turn around and outcrit them instead and actually ramp up the damage, ramp up the number of shots? So if I was uh, first using a Freeman crew on a Sanctus and I fought a cube and I lost, or like a Didorex and I lost, I may switch that now to the Ducat crew because I'm saying, okay, I'm probably now in a longer fight, and now that I'm in a two or three round fight or more, I want to move away from Freeman and move into Ducat, who in that second, third round is actually going to do more for me. And Garrick is going to do more for me because he can put it over 100% uh, in it. Uh, and you also want to look at if you've lost a fight that you don't know why you lost or you would have expected to win, again, check that log, see in round one, did Lorca fire or not? And very often the reason you lost when you would have expected to win is Lorca didn't fire. So if you want to be more consistent, you want to switch to something else. If it's just one fight, taking that 75, 80% chance is usually fine. If you're in a territory fight where you want to have a big ship going around and kill like 12 different targets in a row before they take you out, then you probably don't want to have Lorca on. You're better off with uh, like the Ducat crew or the Weyoun crew or something that you know is going to be 100% because you don't want to fight four or five fights knowing that inevitably one of them is going to misfire on you. Uh, you're So you're better off putting that on a secondary ship and keeping your best ship at the 100% so you're not kind of randomly losing it to a worse ship, but their, uh, their crew triggered properly and yours did not. So um, stuff to consider there. Have fun incursions. Get out there. Participate. I hope... Two, that people don't get, I, I try and like stick in two, that you don't need to spend a lot of money to do these things, that it's not all the paid primes, like usually stuff like the paid primes end up being pretty bad value. So there's stuff like interceptor wrecking and explorer wrecking where it adds plus three, four hundred percent damage against this ship type, or like I said, there's a plus 10 percent crit chance, or there's a you know, there's plus isolytic uh, damage where you can add 10% isolytic damage. Very rarely is that stuff going to be the thing that makes the big difference. Um, again, the numbers we're seeing now are a lot bigger than that. So you've got officers that are adding, adding or subtracting 60, 70, 80% crit, 100% uh, with uh, Honor Guard Wharf to the chance. 
and they've got a thing that reduces it by 10% for like $100, is that really the thing that's going to make the difference? Most of the time it's not. A lot of these fights don't end up being close. It's one side blows out the other side uh, because they just got the better setup. So you don't need to spend a lot of money on these things. And very often when they have a prime thing that is focused on PvP, one, it's usually not even worth it in the month that they come out with it, but it's also generally way less worth it a month or two down the road. So um, again, the crit floor thing is a good example of even in the month that it's released that you can buy this extra 100% crit floor. I don't think it's worth it at all. I don't think the PvP meta is focused on reducing your crits to zero anymore. It used to be. That used to be the meta. Uh, several months ago. That is not the meta now. Actually, probably closer to a year ago, uh, that was the case. That's not the concern now. That's not really happening uh, to people now. So I think that's a complete waste of money. So you don't need to put a lot of money into these things. And especially now with that Section 31 store, you can get these officers now. I know they were hard to get before, but especially if you say, this is the crew that I want to be focused on, you can go into that store and you can be uh, pulling that stuff. They're reason there. I won't say they're cheap. I'm going to pull the pawn ones now, but uh, five, five shards for 5,600 of the credits, like a thousand a shard. That's not cheap, but that's like two, it's less than two full completions uh, of a wave defense. So if you've got a good crew you can go in with, or you know, if you don't complete, you're getting to like say wave six, seven, you're still going to get like 2,000 uh, credits. You can do that. You can grind that out. These are starting to become accessible. You know, I'm 10 shards away from now completely maxing that one. And you certainly don't need these guys maxed at this point, but getting them up to a healthy tier two, tier three, they're going to be pretty usable as long as you're using them on the right ship with the right matchup. And you can do it without, you know, spending thousands of dollars or or something ridiculous. Um, again, I haven't done that. And I, I think I perform pretty well. Uh, but by knowing how these things interact together, knowing what to do, knowing what to focus on, and very often the things that are the most impactful are free. The Q building, you don't need to buy. The Bajoran stuff, you don't need to buy. Now these officers, you don't need to buy. So, And your ship itself, to be honest, is mattering less and less. So you'll eventually go up, uh, and there's limits to how high you can hit above your head, but, uh, you know, let that come as it is, fight the, the people that you're able to fight, but get this stuff and basically at least be able to overpower the people at your own level just by making right decisions. And again, not, not about how much money uh, you're able to spend on stuff. So hope that helps. Have a fun incursion. And uh, I don't know, let me know in the comments anything else. There's other crews too I could touch on. There's TOS crews that also reduce crits and things like that. But I want to focus on these four as like, this is the meta that you're uh, largely seeing at the moment. So these are the things that you're going to get. And I tried to touch on largely, this. these are at least the types of ships that you're going to see. You're going to see the cu uh, cube at every level and scale these down to whatever faction level you're at as your, your main opponents here uh, that you're going to be fighting against. So good luck.